so i hope all of you can hear me uh, can you hear me yes sir can you hear me kekan do yes sir sir okay i hope you can hear me right uh, so in the last class we had discussed first wave second wave and third wave feminisms okay so let's elaborate on that endana first wave second wave third wave tarangam onnam tarangam randam tarangam moonam tarangam so feminist history has been divided into three waves the first wave happened in the 19th and early 20th century adha or 19th nootandinte avasana bhagathilum 20th nootandinte aadya പകുതിയിലുമാണ് ഒരു ഫേസ്റ്റ് വേവ് ഫെമിനിസം സംഭവിച്ചത് ഓക്കെ അപ്പോൾ ഇതിലെ പ്രധാനമായിട്ടും ദ മേജർ റൈറ്റർ യു ഹാവ് ടു കീപ്പ് ഇൻ മൈൻഡ് ഈസ് മേരി വോൾസ്റ്റോൺ ക്രാഫ്റ്റ് ഷെല്ലി മേരി വോൾസ്റ്റോൺ ക്രാഫ്റ്റ് സോറി നോട്ട് മേരി വോൾസ്റ്റോൺ ക്രാഫ്റ്റ് ഷെല്ലി മേരി വോൾസ്റ്റോൺ ക്രാഫ്റ്റ് ഷി വാസ് ദി മദർ ഓഫ് മേരി ഷെല്ലി ആൻഡ് ഷീ റോട്ട് ഐ ഗസ് ദി മാനിഫെസ്റ്റോ ഓഫ് ഫേസ്റ്റ് വേവ് ഫെമിനിസം ഫേസ്റ്റ് വേവ് ഫെമിനിസത്തിന്റെ ബൈബിൾ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഖുർആൻ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഗീത എഴുതിയത് Mary Wollstone Craft Anna she died in childbirth her child was Mary Shelley so there was this very famous writer called Jean Jacques Rousseau man is born free but everywhere he is in chains even Rousseau said that in the state of nature women are inferior to men so even the great Rousseau the great romantic revolutionary Rousseau postulated in his book that women are inferior to men in the state of nature men are the dominant gender so in order to contradict in order to prove him wrong mary wolst sorry mary wolstone craft wrote the vindication of rights of women it's a beautiful book all of you have to read it okay so the first wave feminism happened in the 19th and 20th centuries so it was mostly an equal opportunity kind of feminism so tavagasha pradhanamayita property inheritance rights they demanded that women be given property inheritance rights this is very very important because now you don't understand but you know people in my position we can really realize how important it is for a family to give its girl children inheritance rights sattavagasham okay they also wanted the right to education they opposed the ownership of married women by their husbands so women were treated as chattels like the property of their husbands the very term husband where would you find the term husband animal husbandry right animal husbandry department is there so husbandry means is a sense of ownership and control and manipulation so even though the term is used today it's not in the same sense but unfortunately when mary wollstonecraft was writing this term was used in the exact sense the husband was the owner okay so she said that the first wave feminist like mary wollstonecraft said that women should not be owned by men women are not slaves okay they also demanded one very major right what right is that can anyone tell me it's very crucial and it's very relevant in the kerala context now we are close to something that's going to happen on april 6th what is that they demanded the right to vote vote avagasham okay so we know even today in countries like pakistan women have only half the voting rights that men have a male vote is equal to twice the female vote so that's a gross injustice but women in the first wave of feminism demanded that they be given equal voting rights they are called uh, suffragettes please write this term down if you can it's a very important term for first wave feminism uh, suffra jet suffragette so it's a suffragette movement okay the suffragette movement uh, so uh, suffragettes i guess new zealand was the first country in the world to give women the voting right okay so this was first wave feminism it ended with the passage of the 19th amendment of the us constitution in 1919 appol itrayum mahatvavadangalum janadhipatyavadangalum parayna amerikkile 1919 vare streegalku otavagasham illayirunnu okay സോ പത്തൊമ്പതാം ഭേദഗതിയിലൂടെയാണ് അവരെ ഭരണഘടനയിൽ സ്ത്രീകൾക്ക് ഓട്ടാവകാശം കൊണ്ടുവന്നത് സോ വിത്ത് ദാറ്റ് വി എൻ്റർ ദ സെക്കൻഡ് വേവ് ഓഫ് ഫെമനിസം ഓക്കെ വാട്ട് ഈസ് ദ സെക്കൻഡ് വേവ് ഓഫ് ഫെമനിസം ഇറ്റ് സ്റ്റാർട്ടഡ് ഇൻ ദ നയൻറ്റീൻ സിക്സ്റ്റീസ് ആൻഡ് നയൻറ്റീൻ എയ്റ്റീസ് ഇറ്റ് ഹാഡ് മോസ്റ്റ്ലി ടു ഡു വിത്ത് ബോഡിലി റൈറ്റ്സ് ഓക്കെ 
on issues of equality and discrimination, labor rights. You know, even today in Kerala, uh, we have these terms called anar and penal for manual laborers, for working class people who work on construction sites. They have this division called anar and penal. The anar gets a different wage. Kerala has the highest daily wages in the country. But women earn uh, a different amount that's lesser than the amount paid to men. This is a gross injustice. Okay. But you cannot raise this point. Why? Anyone? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, so even today, uh, the men are paid, uh, manu male manual laborers are paid more than women even today in our progressive democratic literate Kerala because uh, the moment you point this out, uh, they will stop employing women. So, if you have a job, you will have a job. If you have a job, you will have equal wages. Uh, employers will stop employing women. That's why no, none of the feminists like Ajida are raising this point. Suppose uh, some fe some feminists were to raise the second wave feminism point that women laborers should be paid equal wages as the men. That moment, these employers, these the flat owners and real estate dealers, they will stop employing the women. They will lose their jobs. So that's the situation. So second wave feminists demanded that we be given equal uh, wages and also they demanded uh, control over their own body. Okay, if a woman had a fetus growing within that body, that woman should have the right to terminate that fetus is a very controversial point even in very advanced economies like america this is a very fraught and controversial question so much so that even american presidential elections are uh, sometimes contested on the basis of this question okay on the second wave feminist question so even today uh, this question is not totally resolved okay bodily rights of women that a woman should have absolute rights over her own body and they also raised a third point that the personal is the political the personal is the political because what's happening inside your family that is not the business of the state that is not the business of the police or of the government that is why a husband can beat his wife because uh, a man is the king of his house the king uh, of his castle a man's house is his castle so whatever happens inside your house cannot be subjected to the scrutiny of the constitution or the purview of the government or the police this is the conventional wisdom uh, but uh, second wave feminist said that no, what happens inside my house is also the business of the public government. Okay, for instance, uh, in my house, my father is the breadwinner. My father goes to an office, he earns like say 20,000 rupees per month and he puts the bread on the table. He puts the food on the table and we eat the food. So my father gets a lot of respect because his work is a public work. He goes out and earns wages. My mother works inside the house, in the kitchen, uh, in the uh, compound and she uh, raises the children, looks after the children and she takes care of us and she cooks the food and sends us to college and school and to work but she, her labor is unpaid labor she doesn't even get a pension and her labor is private, personal so second wave feminists said that the private should also be made political okay, the personal is also political, not just what happens on the outside uh, sphere but also what happens in the kitchen or in the great Indian kitchen uh, puts that point very beautifully. So what happens in the kitchen is also political. Okay, now please don't think that what happens in Tahrir Square or Jandar Mantar or Secretariat or Washington are uh, political. What happens inside the kitchen in my house is also deeply political. That was a very major point raised by second wave feminists. They wanted equal wages. They wanted, pro uh, they wanted uh, bodily rights. Uh, they wanted... Uh, the personal to be recognized as political. Okay, there's a very important slogan raised by uh, the second wave feminists. So there is a very famous feminist. Her name is Betty Friedan. Betty Friedan. Her name is Betty Friedan. As uh, short form for Elizabeth, right? Uh, so Betty Friedan wrote this very famous book called The Feminine Mystique. I am typing this. If you want, you can write. You can write this down. The Feminine Mystique. This was a very famous book written by Betty Friedan. Okay. She wrote this book called The Feminine Mistake. So, she criticized the idea that women could find fulfillment only through child rearing and homemaking. She did not like, she, uh, she disputed the idea that the role of a woman is in the house. Like you have this saying, so you have to be a very domestic goddess. Uh, so, she disputed this idea. According to Betty Friedan, uh, she thought that women have a role in society also. A role of a woman is not confined to child rearing and homemaking. 
Of course, if a woman wants to, she can do those things, but she has a greater role to play. That is the point raised by Betty Friedan in her book called The Feminine Mystic. She says that women are victims of false beliefs. These false beliefs uh, require them to find identity in the lives uh, of their husbands and children. To find their own identity through the lives of their children and through the lives of their husbands. So if you look at many middle-aged women, you can find that they find fulfillment in their children, in their families. And they don't have their own careers, their own ambitions, their own wishes, their own values. They live for their families. Once people reach 40, 45 years, then their lives are, especially if they are women, their lives are solely devoted to the welfare of their families alone. They cook food for their husbands and children. If they are employed, they go to work and earn a good salary and they maintain the house. They do two jobs and still they don't get a deserving respect in our society. Okay, now we have elections going on. How many women candidates have we fielded? Very few. Okay, it's a very fraught, very uh, crucial question so in the 1990s uh, there started a third wave of feminism even in kerala if you look at the first and second waves you can know that all these women whether from muslim christian or hindu backgrounds were from the upper classes these were elite women but idu kekumbo ee mary wollstone craft ne munba oru feminism enna erpaada illa irunnu ennu vicharikkirathu we know for amazons even kerala had a matrilineal society okay so even kerala had a madhradayaga system meghalaya in the the northeast of india also had a matrilineal system and in south america there was this group of female warriors rebels called amazons so and also we have great thinkers like gargi and maitri who were great scholars of the vedas or you have people like uh, um, uh, sumaiya khadija all these great ladies in islam you also have uh, say mary model in holy, holy mary mother teresa um, uh, you also have you know uh, the as uh, saintly alfonso ma so all these people preceded this first wave of feminism but feminism per se was a white woman feminism they did not consider the issues of black women they did not uh, consider the issues of lower caste women they did not consider the issues of transgender women they did not consider the issues of a minority women but today uh, from 1990s the third wave feminism started taking into consideration the issues of uh, the issues of whom uh, the issues of uh other other unrecognized identities okay that is what's very beautiful about third wave feminism they said our issues are intersectional women's issues cannot be solved solely on their own account women's issues are intersecting with issues of dalits issues of minorities issues of transgenders issues of the working class people uh, issues uh, of um, other oppressed minorities like tribals so uh, they started uh, this movement called intersectional feminism if you look at parvati tiruvatha yesterday i gave you the example if you look at the first wave feminism though it doesn't coincide exactly chronologically with the time period of first wave feminism in europe we have people like sugudha kumari teacher who wrote like രാത്രി മഴ പണ്ടന്റെ രോഗോഷ്ണ ശൈലിയിൽ വിനിത്രയാമങ്ങളിൽ ഇരുട്ടിൽ തനിച്ച കരയാനും മറന്നിരാൻ വെള്ളവേ എൻഡുക്ക സാക്ഷി സോ ദർ ഇസ് എൻ ഫെമിനൈൻ ക്വാളിറ്റി ടു ഇറ്റ് സോ ഷി വാസ് നോട്ട് അഷേംഡ് ഓഫ് ഇറ്റ് നോ ബഡി ഹാസ് ടു ബി അഷേംഡ് ഓഫ് ദർ ഫെമിനിറ്റി യു ആർ എ ഫെമിനൈൻ സോ യു ക്യാൻ ബി പ്രൗഡ് ഓഫ് ദാറ്റ് സോ ദി ഫസ്റ്റ് വേ ഫെമിനിസം വാസ് ഫെമിനൈൻ സ്ത്രൈനമായിരുന്നു മദർ സിസ്റ്റർ ഡോട്ടർ വൈഫ് ഓൾ ദോസ് ക്വാളിറ്റീസ് വർ ഫോർ ഗ്രൗണ്ടഡ് so you are a mother a woman is a mother so nobody can disrespect a mother so they foregrounded very strategically they foregrounded their maternal qualities their sisternal qualities their wifely qualities their daughterly qualities so they foregrounded their femininity the second wave feminism that started in the 1960s it was more aggressive it was more activist like so these people for example we have sara joseph who wrote other or ala hedepen makkal so these people were uh, more demanding and more assertive they said our body our right my body my right you have no right the government has no right to define or pass laws on what a woman should do with her body so that was the assertive phase of feminism and now you have the third wave feminism where uh, you are a, you are at a more female phase female so means there is an acceptance of femininity there is so there is a uh, there is an equanimity if i could use that term to feminism cool ana parvathi thiruvathi cool ana muslims and issues that identify him dalit issues avar kariyam adhe samayam avare proactive ana so in that sense uh, there is an intersectionality to third wave feminism women are comfortable in their skin you are a woman endu varanta namukku daily life struggle anengil endu buddhimundayirikkum 
just because i am a woman or i am a transgender person or i am a gay person or i am a minority person or i am a tribal person that doesn't mean i have to struggle on a daily basis so thank god for first wave and second wave feminism today feminists have the privilege of sitting back and uh, being comfortable in their skin that is the greatness of feminism so today we have third wave feminism which is more intersectional and which accepts differences so first wave feminism second wave feminism thana prashnam adu ettum ubari varga streegalde maatram prashnangalana kaigaram cheyathu nerthe parane first wave feminismile autavagashathinu vendi poradiya suffragettes ennu parayna palarkum adimagal undayirunnu america le many of them were slave keepers and many of those slaves were women appo ende slaves I, how can i be a feminist while i am keeping black women as slaves none of them asked this question and during that time in uh, in the in uh, in the west they were kidnapping people from africa and displaying them in circuses as objects of attraction as curiosities there is this case of the hot and tot venus you might have heard of the case of the hot and tot venus so this is the uh, these are the three waves of feminism the first wave was feminine the second wave was feminist and the third wave is female so you have feminine feminist and female faces you have three faces okay so in the first phase you have great writers like betty uh, uh, not betty friedan mary wollstonecraft and virginia woolf in the second wave you have great writers like betty friedan and germain greer all these great aggressive assertive feminists came through uh, uh, this uh, glass ceiling during this period and in third wave feminism uh, you have people like naomi klein you have gayatri chakravarti spivak you have people like vandana shiva one of the great environmental activists living in india today is the great vandana shiva she says that issues of the environment are issues of women so you can call that uh, yes this is anju this is this portion is from literary movements chapter of literary criticism and theory textbook but the point i am trying to say is that you have to understand what i am saying before reading the textbook please try to understand what feminism is okay uh, because the other book we are going to learn Uh, a, a literature of their own is also related to feminism so you have to understand this before reading your book you have to understand what feminism is feminism is not just a term because the word feminism is bandied about in our society it has a negative hallmark it's not that because kerala is a very backward is backward a society despite our literacy and everything kerala is a very backward society we call women uh, like parvati or sukunta kumar teacher or uh, sara joseph say the feminichi this is not correct feminism is not about that at all it is not the stereotype it is not sugumariya mind gandhnagar second straight that is not feminism feminism is a great movement uh, whose uh, proponents whose originators were uh, people like mary wollstonecraft and virginia woolf this was the first wave feminism it was the feminine phase it was followed by uh, the feminist phase of betty friedan in 1960s and uh, in the 1990s you have the uh, third wave feminism of people like laila abu lugod sabha mahmood gatri chakravarti spivak or vandana shiva that is the third wave feminism where feminists realize that our issues coincide with the issues of the environment issues of the dalits issues of the minorities right, minorities issues of the indigenous people issues of other other uh, suffering oppressed people like uh, gay transgender people so these are the three waves of uh, feminism i hope you understand so now let's uh, go a bit more elaborately so uh, uh, like answering anju's question i would say that it's very crucial that you understand feminism because the next book we are going to learn in this module is a literature of their own so where does the title a literature of their own comes from this title comes from the very famous book of virginia wolf called a room of one song virginia wolf made this very famous postulation that had william shakespeare a sister who was just as brilliant as him would she have written hamlet and othello and macbeth and king lear hardly because she did not have the privileges that william shakespeare enjoyed because she was a woman so unless you give a woman a room of her own a certain space of her own and a certain financial independence it will be very difficult for a woman to realize her inner genius that was the postulation of virginia woolf in her very polemical text a uh, founding text of modern feminism called a room of one's own so in this particular book a literature of their own ellen shawalter makes another very important postulation because uh, in literature there is this very very problematic uh, postulation called a canon it's called canon have you heard of canon uh, as i suppose i guess it's also called in malayalam kanon kanon niyamam canon because canon means the masterpieces the greats of literature from the 
canon. So Shakespeare, Keats and Byron and Shelley and Blake and all these people comprise the canon. Okay, because there is a canon. In music, if you are learning Carnatic music, you have Tyagaraja, Shama Shastri, Muthuswami, Dikshidhar. If you are going into Hindustan, you have uh, Ustad, Barigula, Malay Khan or all these great people. They form the canon of music. Okay, so uh, in Western, you have Beethoven, Bach and uh, Haydn and Mozart. They form the canon. The canon forms the foundation. So, where is the feminist canon? There are some great female writers from Emily Bronte, Charlotte Bronte, Anne Bronte to Doris Lessing, who was a Nobel winner. So, they form the canon of feminist literature. It is by foregrounding that canon, canon of feminist literature, can you uh, change society. Okay, I hope you understand. Because once your idea of beauty, once your idea of literature, once your idea of aesthetics changes, then uh, naturally, in the course of things, your idea of reality, your idea of politics will also change. I guess that's a point being made by people like um, Parvati Thiruvatha and Rima Kalingal. Namalde oru saundarya sangalpangal, namalde oru saundarya shastra aesthetic moolengal maariyala, namalde rashtriya moolengalam maar. Ipol dalidikal alengal muslengal inferior aranamna vichasikinte le manishine ettra prayeri pichalam, ettra debate idalam ayalda ashiya maarla. Karam adha ayalda rashtriya mana. Paksh adhe thine saundarya shastra moolengal namalde maatiyala. Alai, adanya itu nanti gazel istimewa betul. Jadi, pada adanya itu nanti macam macam. Ada orang yang estetik sphere le macam macam itu. Ada political sphere le macam macam itu. A political sphere le, nama kita direct kita intervene cian. Orang baru budhi muntah. I hope you understand. Paksa estetik sphere le, nama kita perlu korcuh ada freedom of movement. We have a relative autonomy in the estetik sphere. That is why women in cinema collective is possible. But where is the women in politics collective? There were people shaving their heads. I guess a woman like uh, called Lethika Subhash in, Calic, in Koilon, she shaved her head because she was not allowed a ticket. How humiliating is that for a woman? Look at that symbolism. It's a widow. It's a very humiliating thing for a wom uh, Indian woman to do mundan. Okay, she was doing mundan on her head because she was not allowed a seat. And she was not fighting for her own selfish interests, I guess. She was also speaking for all other women who were denied. Seats because Kerala is a state which has more women than men, but the predominant majority of people who are contesting these elections are men. So the point uh, I am uh, trying to make is that it's more easier for you to make changes in the aesthetic sphere of cinema, art, culture, literature than for you to make it in the base. I was teaching you this in the last class, the base superstructure dichotomy. You cannot directly intervene in the base, in the political economic base. It's very difficult. But you can intervene in the aesthetic superstructure. Abhiram, do you remember we were discussing this, right, in the last class yesterday? So Yes, sir. Yeah, so politics is the base. Political economy, it's very difficult for you to intervene directly at the base. Okay, you cannot directly change the minds of people who call feminists, feminists and all those things. But you can make a qualitative difference. Suppose the same person was watching Parvati Tiruvatha in a movie like say, uh, Take Off and he appreciates uh, her performance or Uere and he appreciates, appreciates her performance. Then naturally there will be a qualitative difference in his aesthetic preparation. Aesthetic perception and that will gradually percolate down that will have a trickle down effect on his political preparation or political perception at least that's the idea so we have to uh, produce a literary canon a cinematic canon of women okay i hope that's clear for you that's why ellen showalter the great Amer the great feminist wrote this book called a literature of their own from the brontes to the uh, from brontes to doris lessing okay from brontes to lessing because you have to form a feminist canon so there is this very, very beautiful painting uh, by a uh, feminist painter called Judy Chicago. You know, what's the idivrtham, what's the theme of this painting? I, I will present my screen here. I will present my screen. Uh, I hope all of you can watch this. Uh, uh, I hope it's clear for you. Can you see this? No, sir. Uh, can you see this Judy Chicago? No, can you see this? Can you see this? Yes, are, sir. Are you being able to see uh, this? Okay. Yes, this is a dining table. Okay. This is a dining table. Uh, this is a dining table of some people who were not invited. Who are these? These were the great women. Who are these great women? These women are the great writers. Like... Virginia Woolf, Mary Wollstonecraft, Mary Shelley, Hypatia, Georgia O'Keeffe, um, uh, Carly, Durga Mada. 
uh, all these great people, all these goddesses, all these great writers, all these great painters, all these great philosophers, all these great artists who are not invited to the, this grand table, high table, because they were women. Uh, they, they, you only have the plates and the wine glasses. Uh, do you see any people there? No. There are no people there because uh, this party is a party of some people who have not been invited. Okay. There are some people missing here. Who are the missing people? So, uh, Judy uh, Garland uh, wrote this very important, uh, made this very important installation. It's an installation. Okay. It's a classic installation uh, where she uh, made a uh, dining table with uh, absent seats and some plates. And she gave names to all these seats. They were named and arranged in a certain manner. So you could find the names. Who are these women who are not invited? Who are these women who did not come? Okay, you have uh, all these great women, including Virginia Woolf, Georgia Oki, who was a great painter. You have Mark Carley, who was not invited. You have uh, these Greek goddesses like Venus. And, you know, you have Hypatia, who was a great philosopher. You have Sappho, who was a great poet. You have, I guess, Mary Curie, who was a great scientist who discovered uh, radium and cure for cancer and all those things and died of cancer. So you have all these great women, but none of them were invited. Okay. So even though they were some of the greatest personalities the world has ever known and have made, it, uh, made earth shaking discoveries and changes to our lives, they were not invited to the high table. In the high table, you have people like Einstein or Newton or Faraday or Mahatma Gandhi or Nehru or Subhash Chandra Bose. Of course, they were great people. But where are the women? So this installation is about those women who were not invited. I, I hope that's clear. Is it clear for you? So this book is also this book by... Uh, Elaine Showalter is also about all those great writers, including uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, uh, Elaine, uh, Charlotte Bronte, Anne Bronte, Emily Bronte, of course, Doris Lessing, who were not invited to the grand high table of Western literature. You only have Shakespeare. You only have Milton. You only have Byron. You only have, uh, say, Rushdie. You don't have Arithuthi Roy. Okay, so she, she was uh, disputing that. She was disputing that particular thing. Okay, so this uh, you can even for your examination, you can uh, mention this particular installation by the great Judy Chicago. Okay, it's about all those great women who were not allowed at the high table just because they were women. Is it clear for you? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so first, uh, in order for a political movement uh, to fulfill its destiny, if you have to fulfill the destiny of feminism, you have to form a canon. Without a canon, you cannot achieve that. Okay. So you need a certain aesthetic as well as political leadership by women. That's why Elaine Schalter has written a very famous book called uh, From Bron Brontes to Lessay. Okay. So... I will uh, go a bit uh, more before starting this text. I will go a bit more into what patriarchy is. So patriarchy is not just a term. Patriarchy refers to power relations. Of course, I hope you understand. Hmm? First way okay. So patriarchal power rests on social power given to biological sexual difference. So biological sexual difference is uh, foregrounded. Because in Africa there are certain uh, indigenous groups. For them there is no division like man, woman. If a person has a child who has reached 40 years, they belong to one gender. If a person has a child who is less than 40 years, that's another gender. Okay, why don't we have that kind of differences? Why, have, why do we uh, differentiate human beings uh, uh, binarily as two on the basis of our bodies? Why? Oh, this was the question uh, raised by feminists. Okay, so a biological difference that foregrounds men. That gives more importance to muscular power. For example, in our Edekal Guha, in the studies about Edekal Guha, many great writers have postulated that uh, uh, the muscular power needed to carve those engravings in Edekal Guha has been foregrounded. So that, of course, what's the hidden text? The hidden uh, un, under the hidden uh, under text is that only men could have made those engravings because men have more muscularity, musculature than women. So everywhere you can find these 
uh, connotations that foreground men over women even in the studies of adekal guha adekal guha jathrangala petti parayumbo parayum nalla aarogyulla shaktiyulla muscle power ulla aalkarku mathrame aa implements upayogichu adu core idan kaiyullu adond streegal aagilla so keralathile chitrakala eluthellam thodangunnathu adekal nannaan appo adu purushanmaraana streegal alla nu parnale valare convenient aayalle ഒരു എൻറ്റയർ ഗ്രൂപ്പ് നമ്മൾ ഒഴിച്ചു നിർത്തുവാണ് ഹൗ കൺവീനിയൻറ്റ് ഹൗ ഈസി ഫോർ ഇറ്റ്സ് ഫോർ മാൻ സോ ഫെമിനിസം സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ഡിസ്പ്യൂട്ടിംഗ് ഓൾ ദോസ് തിങ്സ് സോ ബയോളജി ഈസ് നോട്ട് ഡെസ്റ്റിനി ഓക്കെ ബയോളജി ഈസ് നോട്ട് ഡെസ്റ്റിനി മൈ ബയോളജി ഈസ് നോട്ട് മൈ ഡെസ്റ്റിനി ജസ്റ്റ് ബിക്കോസ് ഐ ഹാവ് എ സെർട്ടൻ കൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് ബോഡി ഡസൻ മീൻ ഐ കെ നോട്ട് ബി പ്രൗഡ് ഓഫ് മൈ ബോഡി ഓർ ദാറ്റ് ബോഡി ഹാസ് ടു ഡിഫൈൻ മൈ പാസ്റ്റ് പ്രസൻറ്റ് ആൻഡ് ഫ്യൂച്ചർ ദർ ഇസ് നത്തിങ് ലൈക്ക് ദാറ്റ് ദർ ഇസ് നോ എസെൻഷ്യലിസം ടു ദ ബോഡി ഓക്കെ ഇസ് ഇറ്റ് ക്ലിയർ ഫോർ എക്സാമ്പിൾ കുമാരനാശാനെ പറ്റിയൊക്കെ പറയുന്നുണ്ട് അദ്ദേഹത്തിന്റെ പ്രമാദമായ ഒരു ഒരു പോയിന്റ് മാംസ നിബദ്ധമല്ല രാഗം അല്ലെ നോൺ ഫ്ലഷ്ലി അൺഫ്ലഷ്ലി ലവ് ആണ് കുമാരനാശാന്റെ കവിതകളുടെ മുഖമുദ്ര നോട്ട് എ ഫ്ലഷ്ലി ലവ് നോട്ട് എൻ ഇറോട്ടിക് ലവ് ബട്ട് എ ഡിവൈൻ ഐഡിയൽ കൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് ലവ് വൈ ഡിഡ് ആശാൻ ഫോർ ഗ്രൗണ്ട് എന്നെക്കാളും സജീവ് ആശയ്ക്ക് ഇത് പറയും എന്തുകൊണ്ടാണ് ആശാൻ നളിലിലും ലീലയിലും ഒക്കെ ഒരു ഡിവൈൻ ലവ് ഒരു ഐഡിയൽ പ്ലറ്റോണിക് ലവ് ഫോർ ഗ്രൗണ്ട് ചെയ്തത് because he was of course inspired by the universal values of kerala enlightenment by the great sri narayana guru but the body of that time was not a universal body the body was of that time was a demarcated body oro caste um oro gender um oro group um oro pratheka demarcation ulla body ayirunnu for example syrian christians would wear chattai mundum or muslims would wear tattoo makkaneyum kaachigamalum and uh, elite uh, women would wear another kind of clothing so the bodies were demarcated okay so uh, it this body was not a universal body so that universal sarvalaukika mooliyams of kerala enlightenment could not occupy could not inhabit this kind of caste body that is why ashan could not write about the bodily love that's why he had to write about unfleshly love outside of the body ideal love disembodied love divine platonic love because the body was not sarvalaukika okay we know the body is the same whether it's in america or india or africa or latin america we all have the, the same dna we all have the same chromosomes we all have the same structure but that was not recognized at that point of time so these uh, universal values could not inhabit the caste body that's why he had to write about platonic disembodied and non fleshly love the point is that so the body has been demarcated okay so body has been made the be or an end or of sexual difference so your body has been made into your destiny just because i am dark in color means um, i cannot go into high places just because i i have a particular gender so your body cannot be allowed to dominate your destiny your future your body is not your future i hope that you understand so there is a difference between sex and gender you learn about sex in your biology class and gender in your grammar class so gender is a human construct okay there is nothing god given uh, i am using the term god in qualified manner so uh, there is nothing natural about gender okay gender occurs in language uh, baska uska uski malayalam is not a gender language that, as much as hindi but in hindi you know a gadi jayegi no jayega so where did how did this gadi became a woman how did this gadi become a woman so this is a very complex and long process uh, which has to do with evolutionary linguistics we don't know about that but the point is that you learn about gender in language and you learn about sex in biology so there is nothing natural about gender it is something that is a human construct so my body or your bodies do not have to be your destinies okay so by making your body your destiny they also built a certain kind of hierarchy of men over women for example changambaya krishnamulla says narimar narimar and uh, shakespeare also says frailty thy name is woman and all the holy books also contain bad statements about women nastri sandri mahadi and all those things so we have to uh, first say that uh, gender is not something essential okay gender is nothing essential yeah, so the bible there have been feminist interpretations of the bible and gathri spoke all those people have interpreted she has a book uh, an article called moving devi moving devi okay moving devi says we we worship devi but do we treat women like devis no so that's a huge problem so first wave feminists were the uh, people who raised all these points in a very systematic manner so they organized feminist activity idinu mumbe chedare tarach amazons um madeline illa aalkarum meghalayile aalkarum keralathile aalkarum okke chedare tarach avadeyum ivadeyum ആക്ടിവിസം കൊണ്ടുവരുന്നുണ്ടായിരുന്നു പക്ഷെ എല്ലാം കോർഡിനേറ്റ് ചെയ്ത് സിസ്റ്റമാറ്റൈസ് ചെയ്ത് ഒരു മൊബൈലൈസ് ചെയ്ത് ഒരു സിംഗിൾ പോയിന്റ് അജണ്ടയിൽ ഈക്വാലിറ
first wave feminism thalana that's why it's so important that's why mary wollstone trap is so important that's why virginia wolf is so important because they had just one mudra vakyam just one slogan equality okay equal opportunity feminism we are all equal okay that's a very famous and very important very strong unshakable argument and foundation raised by the first wave feminists uh, so it uh, arose in europe and uh, usa in the second half of the 19th century they challenged women's lack of access to education and they also disputed unequal employment opportunities and unjust marriage laws and they reflected on the plight of middle class single women those people who were not married so uh, uh, abigail adams please remember the name abigail adams in 1770 uh, she corresponds with her husband her, her correspondence with her husband is very crucial and in 1870 of course mary wollstonecraft writes the vindication of the rights of women mary wollstonecraft the vindication of the rights of women mary wollstonecraft is none other than the uh, mother of mary Wolf, uh, mary shelley okay mary wollstonecraft she ma she married um, david um, she married uh, her uh, partner she did not marry her partner she had a child out of wedlock in 1870s just remember just imagine that okay so mary wollstonecraft wrote a vindication of the rights of women and then you have a woman called harriet martino i guess this was a black lady she wrote a book called society in america society in america it was by a woman called harriet martino she is very famous because she was a black woman she is wrote this uh a very famous book okay she was a, um, a black activist black activist and you have uh, mary shelley wrote in 1790 mary wollstonecraft wrote in 1792 in the 18th century please remember that okay uh, so these women started very early and uh, in 1869 another very important book came out this was written by a man this was written by a male guy it was called on the subjection of women on the subjection of women this was a gentleman called john stuart mill john stuart mill very famous utilitarian philosopher okay so even today uh, i had earlier told you that a male working class person earns i guess 30% more wages than a woman if an arnal in kerala gets a uh, 1200 rupees a woman would only be given 800 rupees and if you dispute this uh, this if some uh, feminists like say ajita goes to dispute this immediately they will stop employing the women all those women who are employed now in construction sites will at one go lose their jobs because of this that's why no one is trying to even intervene but the point is that what if we give them wheel barrows what if we give them technology because uh, the point made here is that the men have better musculatures but uh, why can't we use man is man the term man is also very problematic first wave feminists said that we use the term man to stand for humanity but does the term man include women then how can men alone represent humanity right so men or women uh, are tool using animals humans are a tool using species so if you give a woman a wheelbarrow she can do as much work in a single day as a ma male guy as a has a male counterpart so why don't you empower women using technology why can't you give women technology that's a point they raised okay so women can also do the same amount of work and even better work of course you know the lady teachers here take better classes than me i am a guy and they are women so uh, of course women are more competent often women are more competent not just equal they are more than so they are better than men okay in many instances they are better better than men look at our own health minister or people like jacinda ardern in new zealand or angela merkel in germany they are fantastic rulers and managers of their countries so women are not just equals of men but they are in some ways even better than men so in 1869 john stuart mill wrote a book called on the subjection of women following the publication of on the subjection of women in 18 uh, 69 itself a law was passed granting women inheritance rights inheritance rights idu valare important ana inheritance rights are at the core of the things why are the so called adivasis adivasis why are the tribals tribals because they don't have property rights okay so property rights are very crucial for your status in society for your ability in society because land is the mode of production so once you own that mode of production you have control over your own rights that's why the first wave feminists very correctly pointed out that they needed inheritance rights 
In Kerala, there was this very pramadam, very famous case called Mary Roy versus the Union of India. This was the mother of Arunthasi Roy. She said that in her Syrian Christian household, her brother, her Oxford educated brother was given the entire property because she was given some pittance as a dowry during her marriage to a Bengali man. She was not allowed any inheritance rights and this was gross injustice of even God's justice, let alone human justice. And she disputed this and she went to the Supreme Court of India and this was one of the most uh, the prominent uh, cases uh, in the history of the legal uh, establishment in India called Mary Roy versus the Union of India. And this also occurs in her daughter Anthony Roy's book called God of Small Things. Of course, Ammu is of course Mary Roy. Okay, the crux of the book is Ammu doesn't have any property. All the property goes to her brother Chako. That's why, you know, Ammu has to struggle a lot. Ammu has to start a school. Ammu dies alone in a hotel room, in a lodge, alone, under a ceiling fan. She dies. There is not even an air conditioner. Okay, she dies alone. Now, so poor Ammu. So that, that's because she doesn't have inheritance rights. So here, the first wave feminists very rightly pointed out the significance of inheritance rights. So the first country in the world to grant women in, uh, voting rights was New Zealand in 1892. And today we know one of the most loved rulers of present world is in the Arden in New Zealand. And uh, in 14, uh, 1914, the first world war happened. The first world war in the first world war was the first world war the first world war. Okay, so the first world war and second world war followed one of the glorious periods of modern humanity. Before first world war, there was a spirit where a great progressive movement emerged with feminists at the lead and feminists and um, the colonized people demanded their rights. Okay, but all these was scuttled or upset by the First World War from 1914 to 1918. So everything was cancelled. All these movements were cancelled. That's why who goes to fight? Who goes to war? Whose issues are warfare and battles? Of course, these are male issues. Okay. So, uh, so uh, mostly wars are male preoccupations. So wars are often fought against women and children. If you go to Syria or Iraq or Yemen, who suffer the most? Of course, the women and children suffer the most. Okay, men fight battles, uh, but women and children suffer the most. Uh, so, uh, in 14, uh, 1914, the First World War started. Okay, and another name that uh, you cannot forget, your textbooks will not tell you, but you cannot forget is that of Frederick Engels, who was the partner of the great Karl Marx. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Frederick Engels said that not only is capitalism a mode of exploitation, but the bourgeois family, Madhivarga Kudumba, that's also a mode of exploitation. That's the prime mode of exploitation we have, not just capitalism. Capitalism exploits its workers in factories, but the modern bourgeois family uh, exploits its women in houses. Not in a physical exploitation, but their energies, their bodies are harnessed. They are just childbearing instruments. Okay, even if there is love, even if there is so-called Christian love, women are exploited by the so-called middle-class Madhyavarga bourgeois families in America or England or India or everywhere. This was a great point raised by uh, Frederick Engels. I will type this down. Frederick Engels said that the family is a mode of exploitation. Family is a mode of exploitation. Okay, you just have to remember this because I guess this is the uh, uh, 150th birth anniversary of Frederick Engels, I guess. I'm not sure about the exact date, but so, okay, uh, so... The point is that Adhigaram Arka Godukanangalim, they will misuse that. Anangal Mahanmar no less, Srilam Mahadigalala. If you give, if there is too much of concentration of power in anyone's hands, they are bound to misuse that. So we have been giving men too much power for so long. For such a great part of history, men have been wielding disordinate, proportionate proportion of power. So if you give someone so much of power, they will misuse that. That's what democracy is. Democracy means no one person can wield so much of power. We have Panchati Raj, we have Tritala Panchati Raj three-tier system, we have state governments, we have the central government, we have the Supreme Court, we have the executive. So there, there are checks and balances. So no one person wields so much of power. Okay, so we have to take that power away from men and we can't give men undisputed, unqualified access to so much of power. That is what feminists rightly pointed out. This is a very Foucauldian point. We will come to that again in post-colonialism. Knowledge is power. So power corrupts. Power corrupts you. So power is very problematic. Okay. So 
I, I will just present my screen. I hope you can hear this, uh, watch this. We ca you can watch, you are able to watch this. Uh, please tell me. Uh, so, uh, we are going to look into the life of Mary Wollstonecraft. Okay, Mary uh, Wollstonecraft. Can you see the screen? Can you see the screen? No? No, sir. No, sir. Okay, uh, I am trying to present this. Hmm? Uh, now, can you see this? No, sir. Can you see this now? No. Yes. Now? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, so, sir. Mary Wollstonecraft had an unconventional life. And the Arthi Erinuti, Tonuti, and the Forgi life, Jivicha Alana, Mary Wollstonecraft. Okay, she was very advanced for her age. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft led an unconventional life by the standards of her time. And I did not know very angry old fashioned Namu American, but she Arthi Erinuti, Tonuti, and the she was a revolutionary. Okay, she was born into a poor family. She began writing. She began writing. She wrote a book called Thoughts on the Education of Daughters. Okay. Uh, she, she was offered the position of editorial assistant in London. So she went to London. Okay. So she wanted to, uh, you know, dispute this assertion of masculine power. Okay. So that year she was offered the position of editorial assistant with a publisher in London. And this opportunity changed her life forever. So she uh, fell in love with and married the painter Henry Fuseli. He's a very famous painter. Please check online Henry Fuseli. And uh, uh, he was already married. So she could not marry him. And uh, she also fell in love with another person called Gilbert Imlay. Okay. And she had a child with Gilbert Imlay out of wedlock. And the relationship with Imlay broke down. She was consoled by the great William Godwin. And they started a relationship. So, uh, Wollstonecraft and Godwin got married and the uh, child born out of that wedlock is the great Mary Shelley and a Mary Godwin. And uh, Mary Wollstonecraft died 10 days after giving birth to uh, Mary. Okay, so she wrote on the vindication of rights of women in response to the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So, in his book, Emil, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau claimed that women were sentimental and frivolous. Women in a college, the Tamasha, other like Ganestratha, every series at Lagari began Kolatilama, Mahanaya Rusovarni, and that in marriage they occupy only a subordinate position as companions to their husbands. So, who wanted to dispute this? Mary Wollstonecraft said, Mr. Russo, no. She was a pioneer of the British suffrage movement. She was outspoken about the need to challenge prescribed gender roles. She advocated women's education and argued for the right to participate in public life. During those days, women had no role in public life. Okay. Even today, in public life, if you go to a theater, how many women can you see? There are just one or two women. They also come with their families. So, in public life, there are very few women. Okay. So, uh, Wollstonecraft believed that it is the state's responsibility to protect civil rights. Civil rights like right to vote, right to own property and freedom of speech. So women have to take their own decision. They should have the freedom to think for themselves. You medicine, engineering, literature, philosophy, abroad, women should for that if you have to take your own decision, first you should be able to think for yourselves. So my husband or my brother or my father or my son should not be doing the thinking for me. I should be doing my thinking. Women should be given the mind space, a room of her own. That should be a mind space, a space for thought. They should be able to think for themselves and decide their own destinies or bhagadeyam. A woman should not be confined to childbirth and homemaking. Okay, reason, yukti is absolutely necessary to enable a woman to perform her duty as a woman citizen properly. Okay. So she says that sensibility is not reason. Reason is often called a male quality. But feeling is called a female quality. And we denigrate feeling. We don't give any importance to feeling in our public life. It is also a problematic statement. But still. Because feeling is not associated with men. Reason is associated with 
men. So there are two problems. Why can't women also have reason? Second thing is what is wrong about feeling? Is feeling something that's uh, to be ashamed of? No. Why can't you cry in public? Why can't a guy cry in public? Why is a feeling denigrated and looked down upon in public? So first thing is that women also can have reason. The second thing is that men also can have feeling. Feeling is not sentiment, is not something you have to be ashamed of. Okay, it's not something inferior. So reason is absolutely necessary to enable a woman to perform any duty properly. If you are a civil servant, ഇപ്പോൾ നിങ്ങളിപ്പോൾ ഇലക്ഷൻ ഡ്യൂട്ടിക്ക് നിങ്ങളൊക്കെ പോവാണ് അപ്പോൾ ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് എന്തെങ്കിലും നിർദ്ദേശം എന്തെങ്കിലും പ്രശ്നം വന്നാലും യുക്തി ഉപയോഗിക്കുക ഓക്കെ ഇലക്ഷൻ കമ്മീഷൻ നിങ്ങളുടെ ഒപ്പം നിൽക്കും എന്ത് പ്രശ്നം വന്നാലും യൂസ് യുവർ റീസൺ ഇഫ് യു ആർ എ പ്രോബ്ലം ഇഫ് യു ആർ ഫേസിംഗ് എ ക്രൈസിസ് ഇഫ് യു ആർ എ കോൺഫ്ലിക് സിറ്റുവേഷൻ യൂസ് യുവർ റീസൺ ബിൽഡ് യുവർ റീസൺ ലൈക്ക് യു ഗോ ടു എ ജിംനേഷ്യം ആൻഡ് ബിൽഡ് യുവർ മസിൽസ് വിത്ത് എ മാൻ ഓർ വുമൻ ഗേൾ ഓർ ബോയ് സിമിലർലി യു ക്യാൻ ഓൾസോ ഡെവലപ്പ് യുവർ റീസൺ ഓക്കെ യൂസ് യുവർ റീസൺ ബൈ റീഡിംഗ് ബുക്സ് ബൈ എഡ്യൂക്കേറ്റിംഗ് യുവർ സെൽസ് യു ക്യാൻ ബിൽഡ് യുവർ റീസൺ ഓക്കെ സോ ഗേൾസിനെ ഇത്രയും നാൾ പഠിപ്പിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ടിരുന്ന റൊമാൻസ് മിൽസൺ ബൂൺസ് പോലത്തത് വളരെ ഫ്ലിംസി ആയിട്ടുള്ള മ്യൂസിക് പോയട്രി തയ്യൽ തുന്നൽ കിളയൽ ഇതൊക്കെയാണ് പഠിപ്പിച്ചുകൊണ്ടിരുന്നത് അപ്പോൾ ഇത് റീസൺ ബിൽഡിംഗ് എക്സസൈസ് അല്ല ബോയ്സ് വേർ സപ്പോസിബ്ലി എഡ്യൂക്കേറ്റഡ് ഇൻ ഫിലോസഫി സയൻസ് മാത്തമാറ്റിക്സ് ഗേൾസ് വേർ എഡ്യൂക്കേറ്റഡ് ഇൻ ടെയിലറിംഗ് യു നോ ഹൗ ടു കീപ് ദ ഹോം ഹോം മേക്കിംഗ് ഹോം സയൻസ് ഓൾ ദീസ് തിങ്സ് സോ മെരി ഓൾസ് ഓൺ ക്രാഫ്റ്റ് നോ ഗേൾസ് ഓൾസോ ഷുഡ് ബി ടോട്ട് മാത്തമാറ്റിക്സ് ദേ ഷുഡ് ഓൾസോ ബി ടോട്ട് സയൻസസ് ദേ ഷുഡ് ഓൾസോ ബി ടോട്ട് ഫിസിക്സ് ദേ ഷുഡ് ഓൾസോ ബി ടോട്ട് സോളജി ആൻഡ് ഫിസിക്സ് ആൻഡ് ബോട്ടണി ഓക്കെ ദാറ്റ് വാസ് ദ ഗ്രേറ്റ് പോയിന്റ് റേസ് ബൈ മെരി ഓൾസ് ഓൺ ക്രാഫ്റ്റ് ദർ ഇസ് നോട്ട് ഡിവൈൻ റൈറ്റ് ടു ഹസ്ബൻഡ് എ ഹസ്ബൻഡ് ഇസ് നോട്ട് ഗോഡ് ഓഫ് കോഴ്സ് ഇ ഷുഡ് ബി ലൗഡ് ഈസ് എ ഫ്രണ്ട് ഓർ സംതിങ് ലൈക്ക് ദാറ്റ് പാർട്ട്നർ സോൾ മേറ്റ് ബട്ട് ഈസ് നോട്ട് എ ഡിവൈൻ figure he doesn't have a divine right over a woman that's a great point raised by mary wollstonecraft in 1792 okay the strength of mary wollstonecraft's analysis is that it argues for the necessity of educating women in order to empower them if you want to empower women the very basic thing you can do is educate them education is empowerment education is empowerment okay you educate women and that will empower them in england the effects of mary wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of women were undermined by the subsequent publication of her memoirs which were authored by her husband as a single mother who refused to marry until late in life and who twice attempted to commit suicide wollstonecraft's life was all but um, conventional as we have seen the memoirs exaggerated details of her personal life which were deemed immor- immoral and controversial so what happened was that in the case of sylvia plath you know Sylvia Plath was a great writer who committed suicide and her husband Ted Hughes uh, brought out a book called a memoir called Birthday Letters in that that took away the agency from Sylvia Plath she was described she was narrated by her husband posthumously similarly Mary Wollstonecraft's life was narrated by her husband in an unflattering way he said bad things about her okay so she uh, twice attempted suicide she suffered so much okay so uh, uh, so it was a very bad state of things so she was called a hyena in petticoats a very bad person horace walpole the novelist called her hyena in petticoats okay so men who hold the road over slaves rule in the councils of the nation and they deny our right to petition and to remonstrate against abuses of our sex and our kind this was uh, raised in america okay and they deny our right to petition and remonstrate against abuses of our sex and our kind even today we have jati rashtriya parties madhya rashtriya parties but we don't have gender parties right if all women came together and formed a political organization and some of the men also supported them then of course there will be a huge power but is it happening can that ever happen just imagine so mary wollstonecraft urged people to look to england where women did much to abolish slavery in her colonies by petitioning queen victoria the ruler the greatest ruler of england the longest reigning monarch of england was none other than queen victoria okay So maids and matrons of the land are knocking at our doors we must legislate so the first woman to be allowed to address a law making body the niyama sabha or lok sabha in america was sarah grimke and grimke told the legislators maids and matrons of the land are knocking at our doors we must legislate okay the times they are changing ningal padicha bob dylan song pole the times were changing okay so in america a lady uh, went to the uh, senate house and told them that the maids and matrons of this land are knocking at your doors you should open your doors women were not allowed into the parliament they were not allowed into the senate they were not allowed into harvard or oxford or yale or cambridge 
So Sarah Grimke told them, you had to allow women, they are knocking on your doors. Our fathers waged a bloody conflict with England because they were being taxed without being represented. So America fought a bloody war with England because they were not given the right to vote. No taxation without representation. You might have learned this in your history classes. But were women represented? Were women given the right to vote? They were also paying taxes. But where is that locust ante of the revolution, not taxation without representation, when it came to women? So where is the representation of women? That was the question she raised. Okay, if no taxation without representation can become the slogan for a great American revolution, then why can't women also be made part of that representation? Why don't you allow women to vote? Okay, it was as late as 1919, only 100 years ago, that America allowed its women the rights to, right to vote. And it was after the first wave feminism and a great movement called suffragette movement. Suffrage. Voting rights are called suffrage rights. So this movement was called suffrage rights, suffrage movement. And those feminists were called suffragettes. Suffragettes. Okay. This is very important. Please remember for your exam, suffragettes. Suffrage, suffragette. Okay. Female, they were arguing for suffrage rights. So they wanted uh, no taxation without representation for themselves. So... There was a cult of domesticity. If you read Jane Austen's uh, Sense and Sensibility or Pride and Prejudice, you will find that these women are domestic. Darcy is an outdoor man, but Elizabeth is an indoors lady. Or, uh, or the men, gentlemen work outside, they go outside, but women stay inside. So these novels, there is nothing to be ashamed of staying indoors, but they cultivated a fetish of women staying indoors, domesticity. They cultivated a fetish of female domesticity. So these were aristocratic women. They will not go out to work. They will just read books and novels and uh, rule the house and servants and stay inside. So the cult of domesticity ran from 1820 to uh, 1880. Like other activists for women's rights, uh, they were marginalized from mainstream society and uh, the publications and speeches reached out only to a minority. So social reformists uh, argued, like Francis Wright, they argued that women should be allowed to the public. Okay, the obstacles that early activists were trying to overcome were significant. The cult of domesticity was attacked. Cult of domesticity. That is the life of domesticity you had in America and Europe. The colony of New Jersey granted women the right to vote in 1790. It was believed that this action was caused by a male politician who was nearly defeated in elections by a female voting bloc. Okay, so just think of the trials and tribulations that the first wave feminism went through. Okay, so like Newton said, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, Einstein stood on the shoulders of Newton and Stephen Hawking was standing on the shoulders of Einstein. We thought that we don't have science. We cannot understand nature. Similarly, without first wave feminism, there is no second wave feminism. Without second wave feminism, there is no third wave feminism. That's why Elaine Showalter is saying we should create a canon of feminism. Very feminist canon. We had to create a canon for feminism. Okay. I hope that is clear for you. Uh, so, New Jersey, New Jersey, this happened. So, so they were exactly caged parrots, caged birds. Okay. So, there were lots of uh, contact books for men and women. Women should look beautiful. Men should be bold, the bold and the beautiful. And this was what was peddled by all these context books. Contact books. In schools, women were taught all these context books. See, there is this woman with a kettle for her head because uh, she is cooking curry. And her life begins and ends with the cooking of that curry. Okay, Harriet Taylor Mill and John Stuart Mill are two figures who endorsed Mary Wollstonecraft's liberal feminist ideas. So, liberalism is a great political philosophy. Alkara, our freedom and research, Thon and Dana Chidon to vote. Are you, are you philosophy on liberalism? Liberalism. That's a problem. But still, uh, so uh, John Stuart Mill and his uh, partner were great liberals. So, there were two figures who endorsed Mary Wollstonecraft's liberal feminist ideas. Okay. So, John Stuart Mill is a very, very, very crucial figure because, because he was a male person and he supported the rights of women. Okay. And uh, so, he was a liberal. So, liberals also supported feminism. 
Okay, so uh, let's go forward. In cases where divorce has been accorded to a couple, the mother should gain custody of the children because the maternal tie is stronger than the paternal bond. So there was a sexual inequality. Even today in Arab countries, if you go to Saudi Arabia or Kuwait, if a couple divorces, the child naturally goes to the father, not to the mother. On the father's day, our great novelist Chetan Bhagat made a very controversial and problematic statement. He said that if I put a coin in the slot machine and a soda comes out, that belongs to me or to the machine. It, he posted this on Twitter on father's day. He was saying that uh, I put the coin in the slot machine. The slot machine is the woman and the person putting the coin is the male. And the drink that comes out, the Pepsi or Cola or the child that comes out belongs to the person who put the coin. That is the point he made. The mother doesn't belong to the machine. Uh, sorry, the child belongs to the father, not the mother. This is a very problematic argument. Okay, so today women have uh, custodial rights over the children just because of uh, first wave feminists like Mary Wollstonecraft. They made legislative changes. That is the crucial thing. You have to make legislative changes. So today you have this Nirbhaya laws and you also have the Vishakha guidelines. Jolis Tharathas Regal and Puvikina. For the sexual harassment in the guidelines and Vishakha guidelines. Okay, even today we have laws like a woman cannot be arrested after sunset. And if an FAR has to be filed, the policeman have to go to her house and file the FAR with a female police officer. So because uh, the law has been changed due to the activism of feminists, especially first wave feminists. Okay, I guess these points are very, very crucial. Okay, because they have changed the lawmaking process, the legal process. Uh, so, you don't use the word man, you use person. Please don't say actor or actress. You use gender neutral terms. Don't say uh, all men are equal. All people are equal. Okay, because the term man doesn't include women. Does that mean women are not humans? Don't say all men are equal, but say all persons are equal. Don't use man, use person. Okay, this was pointed out by uh, John Stuart Mill. What is now called the nature of women is an eminently artificial thing. That women are frivolous, women are playful, women laugh all the time, women are silly, women are ridiculous, women are soft, women are sentimental, women have only feeling, no reason. This is an artificially made concept. This is not in nature. It is ridiculous that any person or doctrine can purport to know the nature of the two sexes. What is the real nature of things? We don't know. Okay. Okay, students, you cannot know the real nature of things. The same goes for post-colonialism. The British people said Indians are idle, lazy, and we know that. This is stereotyping. We cannot say men are hardworking or men are muscular or women are sensitive. We cannot say things like that because the real nature of things is not available to us. We cannot know that. Okay, these are artificial constructs. These are social constructions of reality. 90% of the reality around us is socially constructed. If I have a girl child, I will buy it a doll. It will play with the doll in motherly ways. If I have a male child, if I have a boy, I will buy the boy a gun and he will uh, start playing soldiers and other things. Now, so, this, this gender roles, gender identities are socially constructed. There is this very famous feminist author uh, called Judith Butler. He has a book called Gender Trouble. Judith Butler. Judith Butler wrote this very famous book called Gender Trouble. She said that gender is also a performance. What you call gender is ultimately a performance. Men have to be strong, women have to be beautiful. That is also a performance. There is nothing God given about gender. Gender is another kind of uh, I become a man, I become strong, uh, or you become a woman. So, other transgenders I hope you understand. Gender is a performance, gender is a kind of performance. This, this point was raised by Judith Butler. Like postmodernism, today we even have post feminism. Okay, so uh, uh, John, uh, let's go back to the text. Uh, the duties of wifing and mothering will occupy them on a full time basis. Okay, like someone was saying, you give one year maternity leave for a woman. So at the end of it, she again falls pregnant and she again gets one year maternity leave. So the role of a woman is confined to motherhood. 
her role is confined to rearing babies and children and may and raising them and uh, cooking food in the kitchen this is not correct according to first wave feminists and people like john stuart mill uh, there was another woman called caroline norton uh, these people were uh, lecturing writing debating ivare logam muluven odi nadana kashtapettu debate cheyida prasangiche pamphlet cheyidi pusthakam vaanchi jail poi angane undaakiyadana that's that's a freedom today we are enjoying okay so not just in america we also have people like savitri phule in india okay people like savitri phule in india who who fought for the rights of uh, dalits and you know uh, obcs and we have great female emancipatory figures in india also like uh, gayatri swark speaks of her a great aunt apurnachri padri so she was a freedom fighter and a british were about to capture her and uh, she was a uh, terrorist kind of freedom fighter of the bhagat singh mold you can't call her a terrorist but she uh, could have been tortured so uh, she was not afraid of torture but she was afraid of divulging the uh, details of her accomplices under torture so she hanged herself she committed suicide this is a young girl of some 16 or 17 or something and while committing suicide uh, during those days if a young girl of 16 or 17 committed suicide the first allegation would be that she was expecting a child out of wedlock and so she killed herself that would be the common place stereotypical assumption so when she killed herself honeshri bhadri made it sure that she was menstruating so a menstruating woman cannot be carrying a baby so uh, she so she so gayatri squawk her uh, uh, do, her in a niece grand niece makes the point that by raising that argument she was using her body her body was talking how do we subjugate women through the body and body only then this woman honeshri bhadri was allowing letting her body to speak for herself so please don't think that only white western american and english women were talking uh, fighting for rights of women in india and in uh, uh, eastern and african countries also there were great women like konishri bhadri savitri bhai phule all these great women were fighting for the rights of uh, uh, for the rights of uh women uh, for example you know of the of uh, sri narayana guru's uh, wife uh, so there is this great woman sri narayana guru's wife there's a story by unni r on her uh, called kali nadagam she was a great personality and she uh, she 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 is, she is a luminous personality in our history so uh, or uh, mahatma gandhi's mother uh, his mother putli bhai was a great uh, grand old lady who who she belonged to a pranami sect pranami sect in the ambalathil quran vechirikku nanu parayunnathu appo adu kandittana gandhi valarunnathu that's how he Uh, internalized all those ideas from his mother so we cannot uh, ignore all these great sacrifices and struggles uh, that uh, underwent by all these uh, great uh, first wave feminists okay uh, so there was this infant custody act uh, the women should also be allowed custody of the children during those days like in present day saudi arabia women were not allowed to have custody over the children okay uh, so the matrimonial causes act so women were deprived of her legitimate children see how brutal that is see how brutal a mother would be deprived of the custody of her children a mother a, the children will be taken away from their mother a woman has no right over her own children because just because she is the mother and not the father okay how brutal is that for the children and for the mother so a, a bill was po- passed an act was po- passed called the matrimonial causes act matrimonial causes act okay so um it was not until norton the feminist norton went back to court to sue her husband for not paying my annual income that married women's property reform was initiated so all of you know that this was alimony a divorcee should have the right to gain alimony from her husband so this was a very famous case in india also i don't know if you if you are aware of this is called the shabanu case Shabani was a Muslim woman who was divorced by her husband, and she demanded alimony. Uh, so it was a very controversial case in India. Okay, so you can even mention that in your examination if you are asked about first wave feminism. Okay, uh, so they also organized a uh, Seneca Falls Convention. This is a very famous lady, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Feminist history le sorna libigalil edi thola or peirana Elizabeth Cady Stanton because she was an abolitionist. She attended the World Anti-Slavery Convention, and there was also another lady you can never forget. Her name is Lady uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote this very famous book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was the uh, it was the book that changed America. Not Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln himself said, "This is the little lady who wrote the book and created the revolution." This is Lady Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe. Beecher Stowe. 
Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin. So, like I told you before, uh, many of the uh, feminists, many of the suffragettes were supporting slavery, were um, intentionally or unintentionally keeping slaves. There were other sterling personalities like Harriet Beecher Stowe and Candy Stanton who were anti-slavery activists or abolitionists. Okay, uh, they were willing to put their lives on the line in order to abolish slavery. So these were very old people. Our ideas developed the level. Bible alar on the lay alarm in the Makala Lavoy. Mild that arguments are very parnal. But for that time it was great. Okay. At that time it was revolutionary. Okay. Uh, so uh, you can't have scholars and saints so long as your mothers are ground to powder between the upper and nether millstone of tyranny and lust. Tyranny can lust in a mold. How can you have great scholars and leaders? Okay. So, it's a declaration of independence was read out. It imitated the U.S. declaration of independence. You know, in 1930, India was Congress Congress. They also read a declaration of sentiments and resolutions. Okay. So, for example, America has two great speeches. One is, I have a dream speech of Martin Luther King and Abraham Lincoln. Four score, year, four score and 60 years ago, we made a great... Uh, so, Abraham Lincoln is going back to history, uh, but... Uh, Martin Luther King was speaking of a dream. So this is a dream. Freedom is a dream. For first wave feminists, it's a dream. Okay. Still that dream came true. But you had to fight to make the dream come true. Okay. So they made a declaration of sentiments and resolution. And then you have uh, people called bloomers. These are American suffragettes, American abolitionists. And uh, you have uh, people like Elizabeth Smith Miller who paraded the streets of Seneca Falls wearing a pair of Turkish trousers. This is what is called harem pants. Even today, women wearing various kinds of clothes, Manju warrior, they are uh, ridiculed or rebuked or mocked on social media platforms because of the costumes. But no one ever ridicules a guy for wearing a particular kind of clothes. So this woman, uh, Smith Miller, she walked um, on the streets wearing harem clothes. Okay, she wore Turkish pants turkish uh, islamic kind of clothing that's also very crucial uh. so uh, the next uh, point is bloomer there's a woman called bloomer she started uh, dressing in stockings uh, stockings on them so a negro skin and the woman's sex are prima facie evidence that they were intended to be subject to the white anglo-saxon man a woman's gender and a black man's skin color both were symbols indications symptoms of their inferiority so who is the superior one the white male not just the white male white anglo-saxon protestant male this we call wasp wasp okay not catholic male not italian male not the brown male but white anglo-saxon protestant men had control over black men and women of all kinds so this was the argument okay so then they the first wave feminists started international council of women okay this was something uh, significant they started an international council for women uh, so uh, this um, and so okay so this happened in 1850s in britain there was harriet martineau harriet martineau was born to unitarian parents so the church like vipagamana unitarians for a unitarian secular genitures triana harriet martineau harriet martineau had progressive views on women okay I received a similar education to my brothers, but I was not allowed to attend university like them. I was just as intelligent as my brothers. I was even better than them. But they went to Oxford and, and Cambridge, the Oxbridge universities, but I was not allowed to go to university. So she protested against this in an anonymous publication on female education. On female education. I hope you know her name at least. She is the youngest Nobel Prize winner. Her name is Manala Yusuzai. Okay. She was shot by some terrorists because she uh, was brave enough to stand up for the rights of young girls to go to school and study. Not just to college. She was not even just allowed to go to her school. Okay. She was shot in the head. Okay. And uh, so uh, similarly, Harriet Martin in the 18th century was not allowed by her parents to go to college and study. She criticized America's failure to live up to its democratic principles. America, the great America, life, liberty and pursuit of happiness was used as a kind of parda over the heads of women. Okay. I'm not saying there is anything wrong with parda. So even today there are great feminists from Islam like uh, Sabah Mahmood. Okay. So you have to read them. Okay. So, okay. So, so much for first wave feminism. The first wave feminists also wrote. 
uh, Harriet Martin wrote extensively in favor of women doctors and opportunities for uh, women. So who was the first female doctor in India? I guess it's Kadamini Ganguly. Okay, just because of people like Kadamini Ganguly and uh, Harriet Martineau that women earned the right uh, to speak, uh, you know, in public fora uh, and earn education. Education, education, education is the most crucial thing. Uh, like Innocent uh, says uh, in uh, Pranjayatan, uh, he has education. Okay, yeah, Pranjay doesn't have education. So education is what will make, make us into Polish people and not Pranjayatans. Pranjayatan doesn't have education. So the most uh, crucial quality quantity here is education. You have to get women educated. Uh, Savitri Bhai Phule know, knew this. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar knew this. Uh, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan knew this. Uh, all these great leaders and emancipators and uh, writers knew that education was at the crux of uh, female emancipation. Okay, you cannot emancipate women without education. Education was at the base of everything. In order to avoid detection, she asked an apple uh, woman to hide the role under her stand. Okay, so she she was uh, she was uh, hiding this role this role of uh, voting of signatures under uh, the cart of an apple seller. Okay, and she uh, uh, the apple seller also added her signature. Uh, for rights of women. The women's suffrage movement in Britain had another famous leader. Her name is Emmeline Pankhurst. Emmeline Pankhurst, another very famous leader is Emmeline Pankhurst. She took up the rights of married women. She took up the uh, rights of married women and they formed the Women's Social and Political Union. Trade Union, okay? Uh, so they also formed the Women's Social and Political Union. If uh, the rights of workers are protected today, it's because they have unions. The rights of workers are protected because of trade unions. So, Emmeline Pankhurst was a female trade unionist. They started a trade union. I hope you understand. I hope you understand. So, demands of Pritchu Angan Vendi were union formed Chedu. Women's Social and Political Union formed by Emmeline Pankhurst. Okay. So, there were militant suffragettes. There were militant suffragettes also. Some people used violence. Not everything was peaceful. That was another strategy. That was another strategy. So, Gayatri's work says everything is strategic. You can use your femininity strategically. Feminism. Femininity is not an essence. But you can strategically. You can use your femininity. It's called strategic essentialism. Okay. I cannot say I am Muslim. I cannot say I am tribal. I cannot say I am Dalit. I cannot say I am woman. Because these are essences. Or tube in the toothpaste turning over the essence. But strategically, you can use this. You can foreground your femininity. Okay. So, general truth. Ain't I a woman? That's a question. For American slave woman. She asked the question. Ain't I a woman? That's a question of sojourner truth. So, the first wave feminists strategically raised their femininity. They foregrounded their feminine qualities as mothers. They said, ain't I a woman? Ain't I a woman like your own mother? Oh, that's a question, very touching point and question raised by.